Hello and welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm John Bachman. Joining us right now from our New York City studio is Steve Forbes, chairman and editor-in-chief of Forbes Media. And as always, Mr. Forbes, it is great to talk to you. Good to be with you. Thank you. All right, so I want to start with the Federal Reserve Bank, an issue that I know that is near and dear to your heart. Rumor has it that the choices to replace Ben Bernanke have been narrowed down to former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers or current Vice Chairman Janet Yellen. Both are Robert Rubin disciples. Both would be expected to continue Bernanke's policies. Uh, give us your honest ass assessment of both of them, starting with Summers. Well, this is the equivalent of uh, people running for to be a chief astronomer and uh, they still believe that the uh, sun revolves around the earth, pre-Copernican economics. Uh, neither understand that money comes from uh, people doing things with each other, transactions with each other, being innovative, inventive, entrepreneurial. Uh, they still think it's uh, just printing pieces of paper. So given that, uh, you, have, you have a pretty sorry choice. But given that, uh, you have Larry Summers, who at least has some uh, experience in the real world. Uh, Janet Yellen has been uh, ensconced in a bubble for uh, most of her life. So uh, you have to give a little bit of an edge maybe to Summers, but uh, it's a pretty sorry choice and uh, neither get it when it comes to central banking. And if you could have your say, who do you think would be a better person to lead the Fed after Bernanke? Well, if uh, I had my way, it would be somebody like David Malpass, who understands what uh, money is, understands central banking, understands the need for a stable dollar and normal credit markets. But unfortunately, this uh, Keynesian, extreme Keynesian nonsense of a uh, money printing, then putting it in a reservoir, distorting uh, the credit markets like a pretzel, uh, that seems to be uh, the order of the day. And the amazing thing is, the more the Fed does, the worse the economy does. But like doctors in days of old, when the patient got worse, they'd bleed the patient more. Oh, that's a very uh, descriptive analogy to apply to this. Now, let's uh, look at the economy a little bit uh, more specifically and some things going on right now. And I want to talk about Obamacare and the impact that it's uh, already having on employers. The White House clearly sees the negative impact here as well uh, of the employer mandate. Um, that's why they, of course, are delaying it. But even after that delay, we're still hearing some employers say they want to hold back on hiring and maybe even cut back on hours. Um, do, you, do you expect this? Uh, do you expect another uh, shoot a drop, so to speak? Will there be more delays? Will there be more problems with the implementation of Obamacare? And if so, what do you expect those to be? Well, in terms of implementation, Obamacare is imploding uh, because it's unworkable in the first place. The idea that a people with uh, spreadsheets in Washington could run 20 percent of the economy, uh, that sh idea should have been blasted by the fall of the Soviet Union. But bad ideas, uh, destructive ideas, die a very hard death. So uh, they still have this illusion in, uh, in health care. So it is going to get worse. It's not going to get better. They're doing real harm to the medical device industry, which has been critical for improvement in the standard of health care in this country. The implementation, they are hoping that maybe putting it off a year on the employer mandate would somehow get people to hire, uh, businesses to hire. In the real world, if you think something's going to hit you hard a year from now or a month from now, you're not going to hire uh, when you see bad things coming down the road. So it has distorted patterns in terms of hiring, which is why in these jobs reports you see more part-time jobs being created than full-time jobs. It's uh, ridiculous and destructive. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, the uh, unemployment, the underemployment, uh, and the poverty numbers in just a second. I'm sure you saw that report by the AP. But I wanted to ask you uh, about an article that I saw on Forbes.com by Forbes contributor Avik Roy, uh, which actually said IRS, uh, I'm sorry, the IRS Employees Union is very concerned about uh, having to join these Obamacare exchanges. What do you think that says to you if the IRS, uh, this body that's, of course, embattled, but also in charge of basically running this, um, if their employees are actually concerned about joining? Well, I think it just goes to show when it, it's almost uh, just desserts, if it wasn't so destructive for the rest of us in terms of health care, uh, that these unions that worked so hard to get Obamacare passed and somehow thought they'd be exempt from it is uh, quite a delight to see. And uh, I think you're going to see more and more union complaints. But unfortunately, the president is such a bubble right now, I think he ignores the whole thing and just figures somehow it's all going to work out at the end of the day. And he'll have his place on Mount Rushmore. The details are for underlings, and he thinks grand thoughts and makes speeches while the rest of the country crumbles. So uh, I think you're going to see much more uh, uh, carping by the unions. But it's about three years too late. They should have been concerned when this thing was being formulated in the first place. And we've seen the president in those uh, kind of campaign style speeches trying to sell this directly to the public. Unclear if that will work or not. You know, we've heard from Republicans uh, at least a few years ago, uh, the, the, the war chant was repeal and replace. Now it's just really repeal or defund. 
Um, but do you think there's a chance uh, the Republicans might be missing an opportunity here uh, to present some sort of alternative? You know, we all know the health care uh, industry uh, needs some reforms, and we haven't seen, any, uh, you know, one clear set of reforms proposed by Republicans. There are ideas out there, but nothing that the entire uh, party seems to be able to get behind. Do you think they're missing an alternative, or I'm sorry, missing an opportunity here? Well, they should uh, continue uh, passing bills such as allowing a nationwide shopping and health insurance. I don't know why they don't dust that off and pass it in the House and let Harry Reid uh, kill it in the Senate, but at least set the foundations on positive reforms on health care. That would be a major one. Equalized tax treatment in terms of health care. I do think they'll get something on that uh, by year end. Uh, removing some of the obstacles in terms of uh, health savings accounts and the like. Uh, all of those things would be all to the good, and they should uh, be uh, putting them out there piece by piece having votes on them so the Democrats get on the wrong side of these positive issues and have the mantra, patients should control health care, not third parties and certainly not uh, government bureaucracies. As a Republican, as a you know, job creator, as a business leader, is it frustrating to you that uh, Republicans seem to be more reactive to this issue instead of proactive? Well, the Republicans are still recovering from uh, the debacle of uh, November of 2012. But I think uh, you're seeing certainly on the governor's side, uh, some governors doing very innovative things. Uh, just on the tax front, uh, North Carolina with a Republican governor, McCrory, passed a fantastic tax bill, major cuts in the state income tax, getting rid of the death tax in North Carolina, uh, cutting the corporate tax significantly. So North Carolina, which had one of the worst tax systems in the uh, east, uh, southeast, uh, in fact, the whole east coast, now has one of the best systems. So you're seeing on the governor's level some real uh, reforms. That's where I'm looking, not to Washington. All right, well, let's, let's also talk about this immigration debate. It's been a very divisive issue in, uh, among Republicans in Congress. The so-called Republican establishment uh, has come out in strong support of this, but the Tea Partiers are very much against it. I want to get your take, uh, both from a business perspective and a political perspective. First, what's your take on immigration reform from a business pr uh, perspective? Well, we, we do need uh, immigrants uh, in, in, in the economy to meet uh, certain needs of the workforce. That's why after 1986, you remember they had that amnesty back in 1986, but they did not put in uh, policies that allowed for uh, work programs to meet the needs of the economy. So now we have, instead of 3 million illegals, we now have 11 million. Just from a security uh, viewpoint, we should know who those folks are. And so what I think eventually you'll see in the House, instead of trying to vote on a comprehensive bill, which will not pass, I think you're going to see a piece-by-piece -piece approach and have those pieces go in a conference uh, with the U.S. Senate. One of the key things is to reform the current system so that those who play by the rules get uh, quick justice instead of the huge delays and arbitrary bureaucratic delays you get today. Don't punish those who play by the rules. I think you're going to see a, more of a move to meet the legitimate needs of the U.S. economy. For example, this thing called H-1B visas for high technology, they're raising that from about 60,000 to 110,000. The industry will tell you if you want real research done in this country and in technological advances, we need to two, two to 300,000 of these visas a year. So well, let's raise that number in the House. Overall immigration, raise that number. So we meet the needs of the economy, be a place of opportunity, but know who these folks are. Yeah, they come to this country, they get these very uh, advanced degrees, and they wind up going home a lot of times. It'd be good to keep that talent here in the United States. Now, uh, from a political standpoint, you know, talk about risk versus reward on uh, immigration reform here, especially for these folks who, who are in districts uh, where, their, where their constituents say, we don't want you to do anything about immigration reform. It's very unpopular in some Republican districts. Uh, but, you know, there's, as you, as you mentioned, there's something that needs to be done here. What about risk versus reward? Well, I think uh, this is where leadership comes in. And in terms of uh, the House, uh, you do have a very divided party on some of these issues. So that's why instead of trying to pass one comprehensive bill, uh, parse it out and do it piece by piece. You mentioned, for example, having a green card in your diploma. If you will get an advanced degree in this country from overseas, uh, we help develop your brains and brain power and your uh, sense of innovation, uh, scientific knowledge. We'd like to have it used in this country instead of uh, in a country in a company overseas. So basic reforms like that, I think, would pass pretty quickly. And on contentious issues, uh, let it have an up and down vote, then send it to conference. And if the White House is interested in getting a reform bill, uh, one that may not be totally to its liking, but one that deals with most of the problems, they'll get one. 
Now, I, I want to talk about this. It might seem sort of tangential to what we're talking about, the immigration debate, but we've even heard some Democrats come out in, in support of uh, perhaps some sort of tax holiday for companies to bring a lot of that cash and capital that we see overseas. Uh, for example, Apple and their operations in Ireland, maybe a, some sort of uh, tax holiday for them to bring this back to the United States. Uh, we could also, you know, and that might be an opportunity for uh, more jobs to be created for these people who are graduating with these high-tech degrees. Uh, how far do you think that we are from seeing something like that happen uh, since people like former uh, Vermont governor, former chairman of the DNC, Howard Dean, has come out in support of something like that? Well, what you have here is a, a very silly thing. Uh, we have a tax law on regarding overseas profits that no other country has, no other advanced country has, except I think for maybe one other out of uh, 200 countries in the world. Uh, most countries, if you make a profit overseas, you pay the tax overseas, but they don't tax it again here at home. Uh, we're about the only country that does that. Ten years ago, as you know, we had an amnesty where country companies uh, could bring back overseas profits and pay, I think, a 5.5% tax. Uh, a lot of them did so. $18 billion came into the Treasury, uh, free money, so to speak, and a $300 billion came back to the United States. And so uh, we now we have almost $2 trillion uh, sitting overseas, and we have the spectacle of Apple floating a $17 billion bond issue to pay dividends and do stock buybacks when they have over $135 billion of cash on their balance sheets, but most of it's overseas. If they brought it back, they'd have to pay a 35-40% tax on it. So we do need major reform there. Instead of having a one-time amnesty, let's join the rest of the world and have the same kind of tax treatment the rest of the world has. And then you'd see a lot of those hundreds of billions of uh, dollars come back uh, to the United States. And if we had a proper tax uh, code reform, that money would be quickly invested. Well, you make it sound so simple, but this issue certainly does have a lot of people on both sides of uh, the political spectrum scratching their heads. Uh, let's talk about you know, what something like that might do to a city like Detroit. Uh, we've seen this, uh, the nation's largest ever uh, bankruptcy for a city. Um, and there's also other cities like Birmingham that uh, seem like they're not very far behind. Now, if this is uh, successful, and we use that term relatively, should we expect to see more municipalities file for bankruptcy protection as well? And if that does happen, uh, what kind of ripple effect do you see on the municipal bond market? Well, it's already having an impact on the muni bond market as everyone scrambles to see who actually might be in trouble. But I think uh, what you're going to see unfold in Detroit as they go through the hard process of uh, redoing these pensions, redoing these health care plans, once that is seen as a reality, I think you're going to see other unions be able to say in other cities, hey, we don't like to do this, but to look what happened in Detroit. Bondholders got wiped out, uh, pensioners got hit hard, health care benefits were slashed. Let's try to avoid that here and you might get some serious negotiation. But until you have an example like Detroit out there saying, we want to avoid being a Detroit, it's going to be very hard to get those kind of structural changes in other cities and other counties. And as you look at this, I mean, we, I mentioned Birmingham, Alabama, Philadelphia is another city that's in a lot of uh, economic trouble. Uh, are, would you predict, do you think that there is another city that's going to happen? And if so, uh, which city do you think is, is next to file for bankruptcy? Well, you, you, you don't know until uh, the, the uh, tire uh, hits the road, so to speak, or you hit the wall, I guess would be a more apt way, way to put it. Uh, cities know uh, the, a lot of them that they're in trouble. And there are very positive things that can be done, especially in health care, in the area of health savings accounts which would save these uh, funds uh, huge amounts of money, but also give patient control over health care. And at the end of the day, I think the patients, uh, the, the, the beneficiaries would be better off. But that kind of innovative thinking is not seen yet. And in terms of a restructuring, one of the things I hope they do in uh, Detroit, and I think they will with the agent they have appointed by Governor Snyder, is uh, put in a low tax regime. When you have a low tax regime, you get people moving in, small businesses are starting up, and uh, these, these areas can come back to life again. Yeah, America loves a comeback story, and we'd all love to see Detroit come back. Um, it also talking about, you know, the average American, the working class American, according to the AP, four out of six Americans right now are underemployed, near poverty or on welfare. You know, we've also heard some states propose uh, things like raising the minimum wage. What do you what would you say that was the best free market solution without any government intervention uh, to improving that situation and, and, and getting more Americans, you know, on better footing? Uh, working-class Americans? Well, uh, not, not to put uh, your viewers to sleep, but a key thing is, is having a dollar that is stable in value again, a dollar as good as gold. 
uh, since uh, we have been having this uh, undermining the dollar policy, which started under the Bush administration, continued on steroids in the Obama administration. When you undermine the integrity of the dollar, uh, working people get hurt the hardest, get hit the hardest. And uh, that's what we're seeing unfolding today. So a stable dollar, a new uh, simplified tax code starting over on Obamacare, and you would see this economy roar back very, very quickly, just as it did in the 80s. We made fundamental reforms, got away from the malaise and stagnation of the 70s, and surprised everyone about how quickly this country came back. And uh, we hope we can do it again. Uh, you know, and one thing that might uh, look like an alternative, what we were just talking about, the stock markets are either near or at all-time highs. Would you say there's still good value in equities, or do you see another big correction coming uh, sometime late this year or maybe early next year? Well, you have to remember on equities, even though nominally they are high, uh, in real terms they're of lower than they were in the late 1990s. So for 15 years we've been uh, treading water, lots of ups and downs, but ending up going nowhere. And until we get uh, some of these economic fundamentals uh, in place uh, uh, cured, uh, some of these diseases cured, economic uh, diseases cured, illnesses, uh, the market isn't going to uh, reach uh, many new highs. Profits are already under pressure. So it gets back to the basics, stable dollars, simplified tax code like the flat tax, having patient controlled health care. You do those things and you'll see the market go to 20, 25,000 within 24 months. All right, well, specifically on bank stocks, they're doing very well right now and they're holding a lot of cash on their balance sheet. What would be the best way, the, the Steve Forbes plan, uh, to, to, to provide some incentive for these banks to start lending money at a faster pace, specifically to small businesses? Well, the, the, the way you get uh, capital flowing again is to have a real price for capital instead of the price controls the Federal Reserve has clamped on interest rates. We all know uh, what uh, price controls do to the housing market, rent controls, they destroy it. The Fed has destroyed the uh, credit markets for small and medium-sized businesses or certainly uh, uh, warped it in a very major way. And so if you uh, get, again, a stable dollar, real prices for credit, you'd start to see credit flow more freely. You're starting to see credit flow uh, more. Uh, bank loans have started to go up again, but this is in the fifth year of a recovery, and uh, this is pathetic. So again, you get the basics right, and the flow of a capital from banks and new institutions that rise up to meet the needs that bankers aren't meeting, uh, you would see that happen. And so on the litany of things, after we get rid of Obamacare, how about throwing out Dodd-Frank and uh, starting over on that one and give community banks a chance to compete again? Now, at the rate things are going, and you just alluded to this, you know, we're not looking at returning to a you know, real uh, good employ unemployment rate until something like 2022. What are the long-term impacts of that, having this many people underemployed, on welfare, uh, or you know, needing some sort of government assistance for another 10 years? How, how, how long will it take, you know, even, even when we do get back to full employment, uh, to recover from the losses that are made during that time period? Well, if you uh, put in these uh, basic reforms, uh, you would see the unemployment rate go down very quickly. You'd see companies starting to educate people who need uh, uh, skills that they need. Remember, most people get the real education when they go to work in a normal economy, and not so much in the schools we have today. So uh, it would happen pretty quickly. And uh, then you could uh, make reforms in terms of uh, uh, the welfare programs such as food stamps and uh, other things that uh, disabilities where you apparently have some abuses but those reforms can only come I think when you have a vibrant economy and you will get a vibrant economy when you get those uh, reforms in place and then you're going to have a labor shortage already now even with the feeble economy we have today uh, there are a lot of companies that can't hire a, a, a lot of workers with specific skills and I think uh, you're going to see more of that, a real labor shortage, when we get some of these things in place. And uh, that's going to enable us to have an atmosphere to get a lot of these other things fixed. And while we're at it, I'll just throw one other thing out there in terms of if we're in the repeal mood. Uh, how about getting rid of Sarbanes-Oxley, or certainly the part that smashes small businesses with unnecessary accounting fees? Hey, that's why we have you here. Throw those ideas out there, and we're not putting anybody to sleep. People are listening, and they want to they want to figure this stuff out. You know, you mentioned the housing market uh, a little while back. There, over the last few months, we have seen some positive momentum in housing. Uh, that's been reflected a little bit by the slightly higher mortgage rates recently. But on the other hand, those rates, as they've ri risen, they've also seen to put a little more pressure on home sales. Uh, in the most recent reports, we just saw an unexpected dip in existing home sales. Is that just a speed bump here, or do you think that's a sign of deeper troubles to come? 
Well, home building has come back, but you have to remember that is from almost depression levels. In a normal economy, you get to one and a half million housing starts a year, uh, both to uh, replace uh, old structures and also uh, to uh, meet the needs of an increasing population. So we're a long, long ways from that. Again, on these specific issues, specific industries, uh, the way they get cured is by having a vibrant economy. Uh, then those inventories get down, then you can get real reform of Fannie and Freddie, i.e. break them up, privatize them, have the government do nothing in that area, which has done more harm than good over the years, as we've seen. And uh, these, the, these things would come back naturally. All right. Well, you mentioned uh, there are still some good values in the, in the stock market and the equities right now. I wanted to get your take real quick. Which sectors do you like the most and which sectors do you think people should stay away from? Uh, I'll uh, leave the uh, sp uh, advice giving. Uh, I remember my grandfather liked to say you make more money selling the advice than following it. So uh, in Forbes magazine, Forbes.com, we have uh, plenty of, uh, of people who give suggestions. Uh, for me, I, I like uh, simply going with a few index funds, uh, letting, since I'm very busy in my day job, letting others uh, do, the, uh, do the babysitting. Uh, we have a program on Forbes.com called Intelligent Investing. And uh, we bring on uh, good uh, money managers who give uh, good advice of people who have real long-term track records and do their real homework. Uh, investing is a uh, hard work, and if you don't have the time to do it, then go with the fund. Uh, and if you are going to do it, just remember, like anything, it requires a lot of effort, and there are going to be periods when you're going to have the equivalent of a baseball slump. But discipline is the key. Everyone preaches it, but it's amazing how few investors practice it. I know the information is out there and we've seen index fund consistently beat uh, mutual funds over the long period. So that's definitely some good advice there. You know, I, I want to kind of start to wrap up here and talk about oil prices. They've been spiking lately. Producers, though, have been crank, uh, cranking out nearly twice as many barrels than they were just a few years ago. So production is not the problem here. A lot of analysts say distribution is the real problem. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, President Obama, you know, didn't rule out approving the Keystone XL pipeline, but he has not come out in favor of it. Many people are wondering why, since this seems to be such an obvious solution to this problem. Uh, but should we talk, be talking about more projects than just Keystone? Um, a lot of folks think it's just common sense. As I said, um, it would make sense to capitalize on this little oil boom we're experiencing here in the United States, but we don't seem uh, equipped to handle it, though, right now. Would you agree? Well, the president of the United States, unfortunately, still does not like oil, gas, and coal. He's waging war on all three of them. And uh, the great uh, fracking boom that has great led to the great boom in natural gas, huge uh, advances in terms of hydraulic uh, drilling that's led to an oil boom. Uh, he, he, all of that happened in spite of the obstacles of the administration. But you look at what comes out of the EPA and other government agencies, they still are anti-traditional energy. And so you're not going to see, uh, the, I don't think this guy's going to approve the Keystone Pipeline anytime soon, if ever, which has the spectacle of having to deliver oil via trains instead of by pipelines and uh, not uh, uh, updating refineries as the way we should and having these crazy rules in terms of refining gasoline, ethanol, and things they have to do in boutiquing gasoline that unnecessarily raises the price. All of those things uh, could be cured pretty quickly, but we have a president who thinks that uh, the future lies in medieval technologies like windmills, which are the greatest bird killers ever, and uh, uh, high, high, you know, and railroads, which is a 19th century technology, and other things, uh, sun, which hasn't worked out very well. None of these things are going to meet the needs of uh, the marketplace in terms of moving goods and services and creating energy. But uh, this guy's addicted to the past. And if you want a windmill uh, uh, energy source, you're going to have a windmill economy, which is what we had in medieval times. Yeah, just ask uh, Don Quixote about that. Uh, you know, and this oil industry is something that uh, every single American pretty much has to uh, deal with and it, it touches their lives. So, you know, it's important to everybody. And hopefully those prices don't continue to spike for folks in the country. Steve Forbes, always a pleasure talking with you, always insightful, and I always uh, learn a lot. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV.